Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, trends and events from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and I'm excited this evening because we have a special guest, a conservative rock star, one of the <laughs> few, the proud, the conservative commentators on our side, Bill Whittle from PJTV, Afterburner, as well as Trifecta fame. Bill, thanks for joining us this evening. It's a pleasure, and if, and if I'm a rock star for the movement, we're in real trouble. <laughs> we're in real trouble. Well, but it's a good thing. Yeah, it's a good start. Uh, so, so for those of our audience members who are not familiar, tell us a little bit about who you are, how you got involved in, the, especially coming from Southern California, the LA market in specific, uh, where you would want to commit career suicide and start talking about all things conservative and do it loudly. Well, it is kind of career suicide. I'm, I'm an interesting case, I guess, because I, I was born into a fairly conservative household, and I saw the Thunderbirds when I was five. My dad was a hotel manager. I grew up in Bermuda. And I saw the Thunderbirds when I was five years old flying F-100s, and I said, that's what I'm going to do. And I spent the ages of five to 17 getting ready to go to the Air Force Academy, and I started teaching astronomy at the Miami Planetarium. I was a big old computer dork with a calculator on my belt, you know, and wearing turtlenecks. So I should, somebody should have just put me out of my misery. Uh, and, I, and then I failed the vision test for the Air Force Academy, just barely. And I was just wandering around stunned. I didn't know what to do. I had friends who were making movies in Super 8, you know, or scratching out things on tree bark, you know, it was 100 years ago. But we had a lot of fun making the movies. And uh, a friend of mine was a little older, went to the University of Florida. He was a theater major. And I went up and visited. I said, you actually can go to college for this? You can sit around and, and rehearse and be in plays and then talk about things and drink beer and you can get a degree in this? I said, yep. I said, <laughs> sign me up. So taking that invaluable theater degree, that ticket to wealth and, and success, uh, I basically made movies and did commercial films for a while, just kind of followed the herd out to L.A. And honestly, I didn't start writing political stuff until 2002. And by that time, I was known in the edit bay as, like, I'm the conservative guy on the staff, but I was a good editor, and people mostly left me alone. They used to walk some distance to walk around the base. They wouldn't have to uh, talk to me, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah, I just got started. Uh, my dad got my dad died in 2002. He was interred at Arlington, and I went to the funeral at Arlington, and I saw just this guy who was just a second lieutenant who served 18 year, 18 months rather in the army, and they gave him the funeral of the president of the United States. It was right after 9/11, and everybody was saying it's all our fault and we deserved it. And I just said, no, there's nothing wrong with this country. Somebody's got to stick up for. Her. And you began your path of getting loud about it. I did not ever expect to make any money at it. All the things I expected to do in show business didn't work, and I kind of, I kind of just said, okay, you know, I'm not. I'm a, I remember clearly thinking in 2000, I was driving down the Hollywood freeway, thinking, you know, I'm a guy with a great future behind me, <laughs> uh, and, and, and I just started writing the the political stuff because I felt like I had to. But it wasn't even political stuff, Chris. It was I was talking about honor and and I talk about um, freedom and 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 kind of high-level, moral, philosophical things, and I've always kind of had that view. I, I, I try not to get in the trenches if I can help it. But at the same time, these are the things that bring patriots tears to their eyes and, and things that I'm not sure you have a complete understanding of the impact you have on many of us. And uh, as I said before the show, uh, we're very appreciative of what you do. Well, it's very kind. You know, I find that, and you probably find the same thing, too, that when, well, first of all, we're extremely demonized. And, mm -hmm. and I used to think that the main thing to do, it, especially if I go someplace very liberal, like I went to the University of Toronto or... Oberlin, which is the most liberal college in the world. Oberlin is where region, reason and logic go to die. <laughs> but even then, I thought getting the message out there untarnished was my primary thing. But I found in retrospect that the most important thing that conservatives can do these days is just convince people that we're actually decent people and we actually want to help people. We actually just, it's not that we think poor people should starve or any of this. So we just think there's better ways to do it. And these things are obviously not working. We've been trying them for 60 years now and things get worse and worse and worse. Right. Right. And so, I mean, the reality is, is most people have never met a conservative out in the wild before, and they're shocked to know that we aren't the homophobic cavemen that, that we've been portrayed to be. But I want to give you an opportunity this evening. Mm -hmm. uh, let's play Bill is King of the World. At that point, how would you change the world? Excellent. <laughs> Excellent, yes. Uh, if I was King of the World, uh, the first thing I would do is I would abolish the position of King of the World. Uh, if, if I had absolute power, my first decree would be to eliminate absolute power. 
So tell me the philosophy behind that, because many of I mean us it. subscribe to that same view of thought. But no, I mean it. I'm, I'm serious, and I, and I and I would do it first. I would do it the first day. I wouldn't just do it the first day. I'd do it the first hour, because every hour that I didn't do it, it would start to it would start to gnaw on me. That's the power of Lord of the of the Rings, right? That's why it's an immortal story. That's why it's been told so many times and read so many times, and and why it has such an effect on people, because the ring. The, the ring of power, the ring, the ring represents absolute power to have your will enforced on the world. And good men like Boromir are corrupted by the ring. Good men like Gandalf, who are wise and good men, know that they cannot put it on because they will be corrupted by the ring. And even the best heart in all of the land, Frodo, the most innocent person in all the land, he is corrupted by the power of the ring. Even he can't throw it away. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. It needs to be destroyed. And the founders of this country and the essence of conservatism, when you get down to brass taxes, it's not a question of whether or not a person starts out good. Mm -hmm. We think everybody in politics probably goes in with the right idea. We think that all of these ideas are well-intentioned, but the results are catastrophic. Sometimes the results are evil. Mm -hmm. And they're evil because people are given absolute power to enforce what they think is good, and it doesn't end well ever. That's why we believe in, in diversifying power down from the federal government to the states, then the local level. And we also believe in diversifying power in terms of separating them out politically. Right. But that's not the trend we're going in no. as a country. No. No, we have, we've got that ring and we are sliding on our finger. Barack Obama today, uh, a few days ago said at Ohio State, he said, um, there are people out there who saying, don't trust the government, don't listen to those voices. We all are the government together. All of us together collectively are the government. That's not true. I'm not, I don't have the power to take your money by gunpoint because I'm not in the government, but the government does. Right. He's wrong. The president of the United States of a, of a republic that values its freedom should have said exactly the opposite. He should have gotten in front of these kids and say, by now, presumably, you should know enough about history of what happened in Germany and Russia and China and everywhere else to know that your position towards me as your president should be to assume that everything I say is a lie, that every motive I have is base and self-serving, that every action I take has an ulterior motive, and that every fact I quote is doubtful and needs to be checked. That's your responsibility as citizens to hold my feet to the fire, because if you don't, I'm going to start to run with this ball. And I think Barack Obama knows that the press has his back, and he gets away with this kind of murder. But you're starting to talk crazy talk. You're starting to, to explain concepts like truth and accountability, and that's just not really acceptable in today's no, age. No, you really can't, can those, you? No, we have a living society, and those are passe. The We've problem, yeah. Eject those. Yeah, the problem, with, the problem with, with values. See, here's another thing. A lot of times uh, Republicans are accused of being hypocrites because we are. Yes. Because we are hypocrites. We're yeah. all hypocrites. All conservatives are hypocrites. Conservatives are hypocrites because they, they, they preach a morality and then they don't live up to it. Right. But what people don't understand about that is this. You have a moral code and you make an attempt to live up to it and you fail because you're flawed, but you are making an attempt. You are trying to live your life according to these precepts. Yes. So if a Republican cheats on his wife, it's a scandal. If Bill Clinton cheats on his wife, it's Bill Clinton. Right. I mean, it, it's easy to go through life without any moral standards, but moral standards are kind of like a speed limit, right? We know people speed, right. but without a speed limit and without policemen stopping some of the speeding some of the time, everybody's going to do 100 miles an hour through the, yeah. through the, the school neighborhood. Yeah, anarchy and chaos. That's right. And so, but it's an, important, it's an important point you make, and that is that it's an objective, it's a goal. We know that it's not always completely attainable by everyone. Correct. Let me, when I, when I go out there and try and, and convince people of the merits of conservatism, I basically think there's three things that we have to sell, and it's a sale. We've been sold on collectivism for 50, 60 years now through the pop culture and everywhere else, so we know how to make collectivists now. Right. How do you make conservatives? And I think you really have to sell three things. I think you have to sell freedom, wealth creation, and virtue. But those words have come so far out of use mm -hmm. in today's classrooms. We used to teach civics. Nobody hears this anymore. No. So that you really have to peel all these labels off and get down to brass tacks on these three things. Mm -hmm. So freedom is... Ask people what kind of person are you? Do you like to be left alone or do you like to tell other people what to do? Right. Virtually everybody would rather be left alone. Right. But we're not the party that wants to tell other people what to do. We're the party that says, hey, let me, let me start a business, leave me alone, let me drive the car I want. If I want to have a big gulp, let me have a big gulp. We're not the people who are saying you can't drink this, you can't eat that, this is what your temperature is going to be, this is the car you have to drive, all that other stuff. Right. You have to be left alone. Right. Wealth creation is pretty simple. It's your stuff. You talk to students, you know, I talk to a lot of students about this, I'm a socialist. Bring down your cell phone. What do you want my cell phone? I'm not going to steal it. I'm not a, I'm not a progressive. We're going <laughs> to take your cell phones, all of you socialists out there, 
and you take your cell phones down to a pawn shop. We're going to pawn them. We'll get probably two grand for all those cell phones. We'll distribute them to the poor people out in Seattle or wherever you happen to be. And then all of a sudden, they're not socialist anymore because now we're not talking about redistributing somebody else's wealth to them. It's now we're talking about redistributing their wealth to somebody who is in greater need than they are. Yes. And all of a sudden, it's their stuff. Right. And then the final thing which got me thinking about this is this idea of virtue and this idea that we have standards that we have to live up to. But virtue sounds like prudence and, and you know, and, 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 you know, all these old fashioned ones like sex to your 70 kind of virtue. But virtue really just means don't be a jerk, you know. Don't, 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 don't be a jerk. Don't cut in line. Don't cheat on people. Virtue basically means don't hit anybody and don't take their stuff. Right. And if you can sell, leave me alone, it's your stuff and don't hit anybody, you're a conservative. Right. And when you put it in those terms, people start to get it. Right. And, and, and as socialist as they may claim to be, and it's always good to bring a, a socialist or two over to the dark side. Well, we have cookies, <laughs> uh, and uh, and we've got uh, and we've got you know fast cars and and hot women and guns and and explosions and we and, and we and we like nuclear power. We've got flags on the moon, and we like to go fast and do exciting things and daring things and take risks and and achieve things and live well and work hard and keep most of the fruits of that work. There's not a conservative in the country who doesn't think we need a government or taxes. Right. That's a, that's a, it's an absurd thing to say that we don't need a government or taxes, but we believe we can spend our money better than the government can for most of the things that the government is spending its money on, including education and health care and all these other things. And we're just saying that people talk about equality and fairness, but it's not fair to take a guy who spent 25 years of his life, starting at 16, by the way, and has basically thrown his youth away, studying to be a brain surgeon. It's not fair that that guy gets the same reward as a guy who's smoking dope out in back of a 7-Eleven. It's just not fair. He deserves more compensation, and he deserves to be rewarded for his skills that he's acquired at great effort and with many, many, many nights of party and put aside. Yeah, but that's just luck. Yeah, it's just it, luck. It's a wealth fair. You didn't it, build that. He didn't build it. Yeah, no. No, no. no. Not his skills. Nah. They belong to the collective. They belong to the collective, right? Yeah. Like our children the, and, like, and like our money and like our freedom. Yes. And so if you had a top three in mm -hmm. your non-king of the world position, mm -hmm. but that you could really shape and redirect the country, what, what three concepts would you use to start that radical transformation back to where we came from? Well, the radical transformation for me comes down to simply just better effects, right? I'm not, I'm not the kind of guy who's driven by an ideology and then I go looking for facts. I'm the kind of guy that likes to look at the facts and say, well, what kind of ideology can you build upon the reality that's in the ground? So let's take education, for example. Education gets more and more expensive every year. If you plot, if you plot the Department of Education spending and, and American students' test scores, yes. there's an inverse relationship between how much money we have spent historically and how well kids do. Right. We now spend three or four times more per student than the next closest country in the world, and our kids rank anywhere from 16th to 27th, depending on, on which particular subject. That's not an optimal result. There's nobody who can look at that data and say, hey, we're doing great. No, they say put more money into it. We can fix it. Well, we have been putting more money into it. And the more money we put into it, the worse the test scores get. This isn't my opinion. This isn't facts. what I wish was true. This is data. Yes. It's facts. And it's not, a, it's not a trend line that goes back two or three years. It goes back 50 years, well, 30, 40 years, back to the 70s when there was a Department of Education. So what's an alternative to this? Well, one example is, you know, people talking about homeschooling and people homeschooling. Oh, my God, this is this crazy nonsense. But today in the Internet, I just want you to think about this. Let's say you've got your, your kid schooled in the L.A. Unified School District, let's say, and my kid is homeschooled. And let's say that your kid goes to school and is taught chemistry by a 22-year-old teacher who's got a classroom of 50. 20 of these kids are so disruptive that they're throwing knives and, and scissors at her, and she's not allowed to do anything. She can't discipline them, give them a timeout or something. You got all this nonsense going on. She's all under all the stress. Not her chemistry teacher. She's an educator. She has a degree in education. Now, I, on the other hand, am, am schooling my two kids plus seven or eight kids in the neighborhood and using the Internet. We tap into the single greatest unused resource in America today, which isn't shale oil, it isn't natural gas, it's not timber, it's none of that. It's America's retired population. Because living two blocks away, I guarantee you in any country in this, in this, any neighborhood in this country, within a two or three mile radius, is a guy who worked for Dow Chemical for 30 years or 50 years, taught chemistry because he was a chemist for his entire life. Right. We have so many talented brilliantly talented, hardworking, patriotic, older people with nothing to do. Right. And we have this educated, this, this, this youngest generation of Americans, which is the most badly, educa badly educated 
generation in history. Right. And to not put these two things together is a crime. We can't let this knowledge go. You know, the Golden Gate Bridge, not far from here. We couldn't build that today. We don't know how. We can't build it today. They've we, tried we, we broken don't, bolts. We don't know how. <laughs> right. We don't know how to go to the moon, I'll bet you. We, we've got this tremendous asset that could be combined with a small group of local kids. Don't, they don't have to be the exact same age. That's no. another product of the education mill. But you could teach them chemistry locally. And you know what this costs? Almost nothing. Nothing. It costs nothing. They get a better education. They get, they get a better social interaction. They get all of these things. You get to utilize this access. It's done locally. And when I say locally, I don't mean in California. I don't mean in the Bay Area. I mean in this neighborhood. Yes. And then you have a rigid set of standards and online test uh, aids, and you will produce infinitely better results. And eventually, your kids are going to be working for my kids, and that'll start to move people into this parallel structure. But you left out the curriculum components of social reengineering and tolerance. I did leave those out. I left those out on purpose. <laughs> because uh, you actually want to talk academics? I want to talk Crazy. about I want to talk about skill sets that provide them a chance to succeed in the world. I believe that the morals and the ethics of each individual child is best determined by their families. I believe the family should determine what these kids believe in terms of their morality and what they believe in terms of their politics. I don't have any problem with any of this. this is how the world works. Mm -hmm. But I do think that when when you start enforcing liberal morality on kids who are not, not necessarily inclined to that morality, you're not only doing an immoral evil by forcing somebody else's ideology on them, you are depriving them of what they went to school for in the first place, which is to learn how to spell where to find Africa, what mathematics is all about, how does chemical uh, elements react, what causes the sun to fuse elements together. That's what you're supposed to learn in school. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, you're talking crazy talk, and people want, are going to be confused. Let them be confused. I want, <laughs> I, I, see, we don't want indoctrinated kids. We're not saying we want kids to be indoctrinated in conservatism. I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a second. I believe that if you teach people to look at how the world works and accept the reality for how things actually function, they'll become conservatives automatically. Right. But also you're incorporating things such as parental responsibility. Yes. And caring about what their children learn. And which, winning and losing. Which uh -oh. is also forbidden uh -oh. now. <laughs> yeah. You know, there was a story, uh, a guy was, um, you see these all the time, a guy was running a relay race and he crossed the finish line and he was a Christian kid. And as he was crossing the finish line, he did that. He raised a finger. And that team was disqualified from going on to the state finals because of excessive celebration. Right. Now, it's one thing to go into an opponent's face after you win a race and go, oh, you suck, I beat you. That's, nobody wants that. That's not sportsmanlike. But when you get to the point where you can't go, yes, after you've just exerted 15 years of training and you're pumped full of adrenaline, you've just achieved something, then there's something wrong with the people that are making that rule. There's something wrong with them. Yes. And this idea that you can't be losers is a catastrophe. The, the self-esteem movement has made the most unhappy generation of kids in this country's history. And they're I, heavily medicated, they're suicide prone. They're suicide prone because they don't know how to deal with failure, they don't know how to deal with frustration, they don't know how to deal with, with, uh, with anything other than optimal results instantly because that's all they've ever been given. And I'm just telling you, as a guy who was on a Little League baseball team when I was 10, uh, played right field, which is Loserville, and we won 0 and 10, we didn't win a single game. Our coach took us out for Slurpees after every game and said you did the best you could, Good. We'll, we'll, we'll try and get them next time. Not a win that year. The next year I moved to first base, we went 10 and 0. It wasn't because I moved to first base. Same team, same coach, and we won 10 and 0. And that win would have meant nothing to me. It would have meant nothing to me if I hadn't lost. It wouldn't have meant anything to me. Right. So you have to, the, the part about, about competition is not winning. Everybody thinks, oh, it's great competition. Everybody wants to be a winner. Everybody should be a loser. Everybody should be a loser. Everybody should have to know how to process failure because if you can process failure and learn from it, you will never be a failure. That The greatest ad I ever saw was that Michael Jordan ad that says, I've missed 3,000 free throws. I've had the game winning shot miss 492 times. I've done all these other things. I have failed and failed and failed and failed and failed, and that is why I succeed. Exactly. So what else would you change? Well, I think you could talk about Social Security, for example, which is going to bankrupt this country because of the, because of the way it's structured. So we know that the amount of obligations, the weight of obligations is very, very high. We have a lot of money that's due over time. It's $100 trillion, fair amount of cash. Right. And what, what progressives want to do is they want to take more and more and more of other people's money and put it on the other side of that seesaw to get these two things to balance out.
Right. Well, we want them to balance out too. But rather than putting all this extra cash on the on the other side, what we want to do is we want to move the fulcrum, and you only have to move it that much. Just move it that much. So if you normally retire at 65, when Social Security was written in the 60s, people retired at 65, and you got your heart attack at 69, right? I mean, that's how it happened. Yeah. You had four or five years on retirement. Now people live to be in their 90s routinely in their 80s and 90s. So this idea of if you if you are 10 years out from retirement, we keep your promise you retire at 65. More than 10, 10 to 20, you retire at 66. 20 to 30, you retire at 67. And if you're just starting now, you retire at 67 or 68. It's not going to hurt them. They're going to be living better at 68 than anybody ever did at 65. Right. And then Social Security is actually an ATM. It actually generates money. Right. How hard is this? It doesn't have to be. It, it's not. But you're also talking about education systems and mechanical advantage when you're moving folks. I and know. Things. See, and this is why you don't. This why yeah. you don't. That's, see, if you give kid an education, they're going to become a conservative. <laughs> and, and that's why we have to stop it now. No, but they know how to put condoms on bananas, and that's the main thing. You know, that's the main thing for succeeding in, in the world. It, this kind of see, this is the point, Chris. Right? This is it. There's no physics does not have an ideology. Mechanical advantage does not come with politics. These are things that have actual, physical, real-world consequences. Always the same every time. You can't fight the laws of nature. Right. And if you have a political philosophy that's in line with these kind of things, right. you'll be a happier and more successful person. But I'm just happier that banana populations are not overrunning the earth, <laughs> personally. <laughs> that's, that's just my, my, my thing. You just give it some time. <laughs> start subsidizing that. We're going to be drowning in bananas before we know what to do. Yeah. And so any other options uh, in the few minutes we have left that you would use to, to redirect all I would all I would really try to do is to try and, and, and peel off these these labels. Partially that's to my political advantage because we've been so badly demonized, but also it doesn't help anything. Everybody's stressed enough, everybody's everybody's scared enough, everybody knows that this isn't working, everybody knows that this debt bomb is coming, and everybody knows that it's it's like watching you know the, the there's that great scene in Titanic, right? And I know a lot about the Titanic story. So these guys are up in the crow's nest and they say, Iceberg right ahead, and they start turning the ship and they just graze it. Well, we're in a position where there are two guys up in the crow's nest and they're looking with binoculars and they go, iceberg, 140 miles ahead. And we just keep sailing straight towards the middle of this thing and we know it's going to hit and we know it's going to be a catastrophe and we don't change course and I don't know why. Well, we're expecting the iceberg to move for us. We're expecting something, aren't we? We're expecting some piece of magic, but magic doesn't happen like that. Right, right. And so if, if people want to learn more mm -hmm. about the kinds of things that, that you're espousing here, what's the best way for them to track you and to, to find out what you're up to and, and your thought process on things? Well, I have a, on, on YouTube, I have Bill Whittle channel, which has got about 100 videos. Um, and I've been, lately I've been uh, doing most of my commentary as the virtual president. I'm just the president. I speak as the president from the White House. I speak from the, from inauguration on the steps of the Capitol. I speak from the virtual press conferences and from the floor of the House of Representatives. So it's uh, MrVirtualPresident.com is where those videos are. Okay. But I'm not the guy really to even, I mean, I'm very flattered that people would look at me. But if they're interested in these ideas, there's two things I would do. I'd, I'd look at anything on YouTube by Milton Friedman. And if you really want to understand economics, not just conservative view of economics, you understand how economics work, get a book called Eat the Rich by P.J. O'Rourke. And P.J. O'Rourke's book, talks about how economics work and how socialist economies work and capitalist economies work and it's a great start. I'm still struck by the virtual president and thinking that the, it brings to mind um, images of a president that doesn't actually work and plays golf all the time. No, 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 I'm, so I'm a full-time virtual president. Uh, well, I would argue that others might be the same. No, no, I'm, I'm not playing. I'm not playing. Um, you know, uh, Tiger Woods uh, 13 golf at home. I'm, I'm actually out there doing virtual presidency job. Well, I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule oh, to come to be here. here, especially I know you'll be speaking later this night, mm -hmm. tonight at the uh, Conservative Forum. But if you'll hold on for just a moment, mm -hmm. we need to take a quick word okay. from our sponsor, the Conservative Forum.
well, I say I'm a constitutional law attorney. And they say, oh, really, what kind of constitutional law attorney? I say, well, I'm the kind, the true kind, the kind that believe that the Constitution is what the Constitution says and what it was intended to say. Anything beyond that is tyranny and should not be allowed. Um, So it's come to this, my friends. You're ready the second American Revolution against a ruling class that simply lectures but does not listen or defend the American people. It is government versus the people. Am I right? Yeah. Look at the Electoral College example, right? A leftist popular challenge to states' rights. You think the founders were brilliant people? Did they not know what they were doing? by carefully calibrating to get the small states and the big states to come together? Why does Wyoming get two senators in California? Actually, I'd rather have Wyoming's two senators. <laughs> And welcome back to the right side. That was a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. And in addition to sponsoring the show, which we obviously uh, appreciate tremendously, what they're best known for is their speaker series. And tonight, the reason we were lucky enough to have Bill Whittle in the studio with us is that he'll be speaking at the Conservative Forum uh, as May's speaker at 432 Steerland Road here in Mountain View, about three minutes from the studio. But in June, we'll be... Uh, graced with the presence of Ying Ma, author of A Chinese Girl in the Ghetto. She'll be sharing her story of how she moved to the United States with the idea that it was the land of opportunity and moved into some of the slummier parts of Oakland and understood what diversity is all about. Uh, additionally, in uh, July on the 9th, as opposed to the first Tuesday of the month when the meetings are regularly held, we'll be uh, hosting Debbie Bacigalupi, a former congressional candidate as well as a former guest of the show. And then in, in August, we'll be hosting Steve Forbes, yes, that Steve Forbes, with his new book and his co-author, uh, The Freedom Manifesto. And so, again, if you'd like more details on where you can find out about the Conservative Forum, you can find that at theconservativeforum.com. In closing this evening, Bill and I covered a lot of ground and uh, hopefully dispelled some of the myths about how uh, uncaveman and how uh, unobnoxious conservatives can be. I hope you'll do a little bit more research, find out more about Bill in the various places you can find him, either on Google or on YouTube or at places like PJTV. Thanks for joining us this evening. Again, this has been The Right Side, and I've been your host, Chris Pareja. Hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks a lot.